good to go. So uh, I'm here to talk about something I'm really excited about, and I hope by the end of this talk you're excited about it too. Um, it's because it's the future of the web, and it's the future of a multi-language web. And no, JavaScript isn't dead or dying or anything like that, as opposed to what Nick implied that I said, which I never said. <laughs> about me. I am a robotics author and addict. I've written two books about JavaScript and IoT. So um, that's, that's my, my hobby. Uh, that picture is of me. I have light up sticks. The jacket had lights all over it. My pants lit up and they were all working together to the music. It was pretty cool um, and a lot of fun. And they were UV lights. You can see the UV paint on my face reacting to them. Um, so I Twitch stream hardware and software at Node Botanist when I'm not being a developer avocado at Cloudflare. Um, so yeah. I also have two lovely cats. Uh, there's Ace on the left and Arya on the right. They're my babies. And if you ask or just don't stop me, I will show you millions of pictures of them. But you're not here for that. You're here because you're thinking, what is WebAssembly? And I find the best way to start talking about what WebAssembly is is by saying what WebAssembly really isn't. WebAssembly is not just a programming language. I mean, technically it is a programming language, but it's more of an instruction set for those of you who've done uh, assembly or you know, uh, risk programming. It's more of an instruction set than a, than a, than a programming language, but still it can be written directly, um, which means assuredly in LinkedIn we'll see, hey, do you have 10 years of WebAssembly programming experience? Uh, just like we saw, do you have 10 years of Java experience, JavaScript or Node experience in 2008. <laughs> so it's not the death of JS, probably. Um, there are some people who want to use WebAssembly to completely get rid of JavaScript. Uh, there are lots of people who do not, and we'll get into that as we talk more about what it is. And it's not something you can just ignore because that's going to go away. I, uh, I'll give you a personal anecdote about why you shouldn't do that in general. I remember when ReactJS was pre premiered at um, JavaScript Conf US. So was anybody else there that fateful day when when those React folks got up there and said XML in JavaScript and you could hear a pin drop? <laughs> I swear, the premiere of React, I remember walking out thinking, I'm, I don't have to worry about that. That's not going anywhere. <laughs> and sure enough, it just turns out that talk was written really badly and it's a, now I can't ignore it. React is everywhere. I use it. It's great. And I love React. It's just that talk was just not not the, the best landed one. What WebAssembly is, let's talk a little bit, let's flesh out a little bit more about what it is. It's a compilation target for other languages to compile to, as well as a language in itself. So it's, 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 a, it's a compile target, just like uh, when you think of JVM languages, they are compile targets for the JVM, just as my, and they allow you to use other languages within the JVM. WebAssembly allows us to use other languages by being a compile target. It's an augmentation of the abilities of JavaScript by allowing other languages to operate in the browser. That's huge, and I'll explain why in a bit. But most importantly, it's magic. Not literally, but pretty literally, and you'll see why later, but it's, it's, it's very magical. So WebAssembly has a compilation target. You write code in other languages, Rust, C, C++, Go, uh, C Sharp. There is a PHP WebAssembly module. Um, <laughs> I, love what, I love PHP, don't get me wrong. Those are some scrappy folks that are still working on PHP. I love them. And they're building a WebAssembly target. I'm like, you go. I love them. Um, those, but yeah, a lot of the languages you think of in day to day have a WebAssembly compile target. But then the question you have to ask yourself is, what? Why? Why would we need anything other than JavaScript? Or why are we doing this? Or what do you mean I need to learn a whole new programming language called Rust? Which, by the way, you should totally learn Rust. There are so many reasons you would want this in your life. And I'm going to go over just a few of them, but they're pretty much the major ones. This is a new era for the web. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not grandstanding I, because I really haven't done a lot of work to make this happen. I'm really just up standing up here talking about it. And you know, like I get this reaction a lot when I tell people that, when this, they say this is the future of the web. They're like, all right, where are you sick, Cass? Mm -hmm, I'm sure. But seriously, WebAssembly is comparable to bringing the power that goes to, into the JVM into the browser, creating an evolution of the web as we know it. Who here works on Java, just pure straight Java? 
Okay, a few hands. Who here works on a JVM language, something that compiles uses the JVM? I see about twice as many hands go up. But you get the, the idea of the power that this holds for the browser. WebAssembly allows us to bring other languages in and is truly an evolution of the web as we know it. And you're like, okay, kind of, kind of get it, but I need, I need some hand-drawn illustrations in OneNote. So that's what you can get. <laughs> so I call this ancient.png, and this is when this is pre-Ajax. So you've got your browser, and it does HTML, it does CSS, and it does JavaScript. Uh, by JavaScript, I mean it auto plays MP3s. Thanks, MySpace. And then on the server, you had literally everything else. And whenever you wanted a new piece of data, you had to refresh the entire page and then come back, and then we get a new page and come back, and then get the same page but with a different piece of data and come back. Then we have then.png. The browser now has Ajax, and we have actual applications where your server becomes more of a REST API because you request a page, you get the page back, but then you make an Ajax request to update a part of the page, and you get back some results. Ajax results, Ajax results. Sweet. Awesome. This is now.png. This is stuff we can use now. But with the browser, we've got HTML, CSS, JavaScript with Ajax, and service workers, which I'm not going to get into, but they're related and they're awesome, and WebAssembly. I was going to use a sparkly font for WebAssembly, but I ran out, so I used like the most metal font I could find for WebAssembly, because yeah, WebAssembly! So now you request a page, and your server, oh, also your server says lol okay, because your server's probably not a server. Your server's probably just a bunch of serverless functions running on somewhere else's server. <laughs> so you request a page, and you get the page back. Then you use WebAssembly to compute something. Cool, you just stay in the browser. Then you use a service worker third-party module because they go offline for a little while. Sure, you're still in the browser. Ajax, and then your server's like, yeah, okay, here's the data you need. Now you're like, okay, I get it. I, I see the, the idea of the power of being able to stay in the browser and do things with their own languages, but I don't have time to use it. I'm gonna walk off. Why does this matter? That's really what's gonna get, hopefully get you excited about WebAssembly. Why does this matter? Augmenting JavaScript at its not so strong points. I love JavaScript. It is the cockroach of languages, and I say that in the most loving, it comes from the biggest place of love in my heart. JavaScript is the cockroach of languages. It's never going anywhere. Um, <laughs> I love it. It's, a const and it's constantly evolving to prevent its own death. Have you seen the news articles about these, these cockroaches that are now like impervious to certain forms of insecticide? Like that's JavaScript. Like it, it, it with stood coffee script, it's holding its own against TypeScript, it's probably gonna live through WebAssembly, it's just not gonna go anywhere. But another reason this, does, this matters is, who wants to rewrite this 10-year-old piece of C++ code that's extremely performant and has unit tests in JavaScript? Who wants to do that? Yeah, that's what I thought. Me neither. Uh, fewer calls to the server because you have more compute power in the browser via WebAssembly and you, your WebAssembly modules can run that in the browser, which is less latency, which is fewer web app calls and better web app experiences. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about how we augment JS at its not so strong points. Who wants to write a banking app in JavaScript? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, I see, yes, yeah, still, that's still what I thought. One hand, one sarcastic, I'm gonna raise my hand to be a contrarian hand. Um, if you're writing anything that relies on mathematical, numerical accuracy or speed, that meant until now, another Ajax call to have another language do all the math, with WebAssembly, you can do this in the browser with Rust or C++ or C or whatever language you're much more comfortable writing your financial calculations in. Hooray. Other JS not so strong points. Type coercion side effects. String equal equals zero is true. If you put the third equal sign in there, it's false, I get it. But still, that's not great. Especially the accidental concat when you meant to add and vice versa. Dealing with numbers and strings in JavaScript can be a kind of a pain because of the lack of a really formal type system. And before you at me, yes, I know TypeScript exists, all right? I get it. They even have a WebAssembly target. I know they exist, but I'm talking about JavaScript here. So type of, uh, type of array is not array. Anybody else with that? It's not a, not a fun time. So WebAssembly means using the right tool for the job. It means using the right programming language for each task. It means JavaScript is really good at DOM manipulation, CSS classes adding and removing. It's really good at that sort of thing. Let JavaScript do that. And then WebAssembly means let's let other languages do what, what you know, JavaScript maybe isn't the best at. But this will kill JavaScript. No, 
Like I already said, it's a cockroach of languages. Probably not. For most situations, it makes JS better by letting it do what it's good at and ignoring the rest. If you're writing a web server and you find out another language is doing the thing you are doing much better, you just add that language to your web server. I mean, there's very minimal problems to doing that unless you know they're like completely different or no one else on your team knows that programming language. But in the browser, that was impossible up until WebAssembly became a thing. However, Wasm tool chains are gaining more and more abilities by the, the day, and some teams <coughs> would like to have Wasm be able to do everything JS does and eventually, eventually replace JS, as far as I'm aware. There are WebAssembly modules that can access the DOM and be used to manipulate the shadow DOM at the time of this writing. So there are some who want to remove, who want to basically uproot JavaScript and say you don't need any JavaScript ever. And then there are others that say, no, WebAssembly is an augmentation of JavaScript. So we gotta be careful and we gotta, you know, think about what we do with, the, with this new set of information. It makes the web better by creating better browser experiences. And I'm talking like Jeff Goldblum, apartments.com. Have you seen those commercials where like the dog turns into a couch? Like those kinds of browser experiences. I'll prove it by letting you take a closer look with the demonstration I have. This is my demonstration. I used Bootstrap because I'm not a designer. And I'm going to select the source. Now, I, uh, the, the speakers last night know I always look goofy in pictures, so I look goofy on my own terms. Oh, wait, what? Oh, right. There we go. OK, cool. So there's my image, right? Now I'm going to rotate it right. Boop. I'm going to zoom in a little. Rotate left. Boop. Yeah, but CSS can do that, cast. Let's. Let's, pull, let's do some do something cool. Grayscale, that fast. Then we've got add contrast, remove contrast, and blur. That blur <laughs> that is so fast. So that what that is is image magic, the CLI tool image magic. It's uh, someone compiled it to the Wasm web target, and so I'm manip manipulating this image in the browser using web web uh, image magic. Now to prove that I'm not uh, that there's nothing up my sleeve. I'm not only going to turn off my Wi-Fi, I'm going to go to the HTTP server that's serving everything up and cancel it out too. So you can see my server's off, my Wi-Fi's turned off, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go grayscale again. Still works, because it's all in the browser. What? <laughs> like, you could build a photo editing app in the browser now without wanting to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> so there you go. That's my, um, that's my demo. The, the code will be posted um, later. Everything's open source to me. The demo. Uh, actually, I should apologize. I shouldn't have said shoot yourself in the foot. That's, uh, I, I was trying to derail from a worse joke, and I apologize for my uh, insensitivity on that matter. Um, without making you want to quit your job, I think it should be a better way of saying it. Anyway, so the demo uses watch image, image magic and manipulates images in the browser up to 10 times faster than JS can. That is the super conservative don't at me version of that, that comparison. JS just can't straight up do some of the stuff that, that that demo just did. And it certainly takes more than 10 times for some, some functions. But for like the slowest thing, it was 10 times faster with, with image magic. So I put that so someone doesn't try it later and send me like, ah, oh, this was only 10 times faster and you said 20. OK. So <laughs> this is the real power of not having to rewrite code and being able to let us use the right tool for the job. Image magic is the right tool for the job when you want to manipulate images. Like, it just is. It's, it's been around forever. It's uh, really great at what it does. But what about Node.js? What, wait, what, wait what, what, what about Node.js? You, you were talking about the web. But did you notice I only said browser a few specific times? This talk is very well rehearsed, so I only say browser where I have to. I said this is the future of the web, not just the future of the browser. There's some cool Node.js stuff we can do about here. So who here has dealt with native heckin modules. And who here has seen a compile error from a native heckin module? I should, I should actually see more hands up, because if you've ever done an NPM install and there's been a really weird crash message, chances was it was an image, it was a native module that crashed on you. And as Brian Cranston is mouthing, they are not a fun day. He's saying fun. He says, fun! <laughs> so why, do, why are native modules such a pain? 
they have to be compiled on download for the architecture that you're installing on. So if you're on a Debian machine, you have to download the source code, then compile it on the Debian machine. So in order to install any native module, you have to have a tool chain to install the module. So it's like having the dev environment installed, even if you're just installing, like, say, a React Native project. project. If you haven't pre-compiled your native modules, your user then has to install basically your dev environment. And you either have to compile on every platform or leave platforms off from support. Like, let's say your native module doesn't work on ARM. Buy a Raspberry Pi. That is not, that's not going to work. Buy all microcontrollers. Um, yeah, buy a lot of cell phones. Uh, you know, like, it's just not going to work. Um, node JIP is fluid. And don't, don't get me wrong, I respect the heck out of their work. Um, they do a lot of really great work, but their task is Sisyphean to make nat native modules work well on every single platform. That is a Sisyphean and thankless task. So WebAssembly works on Node greater than 8.0, which means it works on all versions of Node that are not at end of life. So, so we've got Web, we got WebAssembly modules, we work on Node 8, and they're pre-compiled. What, wait, what, whoa, what did I do? There we go. So, WebAssembly modules are pre-compiled binaries, so they're portable to any platform that runs JS. When you npm install a module, a library that has a WASM module, it just takes the pre-compiled WASM file and downloads it. It then runs no matter where you're at, as long as it runs Node.js and you're running over Node 8. No more recompilation on every download on every architecture, for reals. We can stop worrying about what architecture the user is using if they are running a WebAssembly module, if, as long as they can run Node greater than 8. So this is a quote I got from Lori Voss right before um, JSConf Asia. I just realized the mic's been like pointing the wrong way. Hopefully I mean, everybody can hear me. I project, but hopefully. Everyone wants to deprecate node JIP, and WebAssembly would eventually allow us to do this. He's right. There's this work on uh, a project called WASI, which is the WebAssembly system interface, which is kind of like the, that last piece of glue in between WebAssembly modules and native code. Now, WASI would be more like basically node JIP would be scaled down to WASI uh, under WebAssembly. And then you're, you would have a WASI layer that you would need for each, each platform and architecture. So some system calls, we still got to kind of work out what the deal is there. And we got to figure out WASI, but it's being actively worked on. And when I say the future of the web, I do mean it, because WebAssembly is even invading serverless. I work with Cloudflare, and this is where I do my song and dance. Uh, we have a serverless offering called Cloudflare Workers. If you scan that code, you get 30 free um, functions and uh, a subdomain of workers.dev. I'll show this again later in case um, you're interested. Uh, but how do we get to this magical land of, of WebAssembly? If you'd like to learn Rust, and I highly recommend you learn Rust, you read the Wasm book, uh, read the Rust Wasm book and the Rust book. The Rust book is at uh, that URL. These slides will be available online just after my talk. The Rust Wasm book, they were both written by core team members of Rust, um, so they're pretty, pretty darn good. If you'd like to use C and C++, check out nscripten. Um, I believe that's what, that was what was used to compile the uh, image magic library that I used today. And if you are a fan of C Sharp or Microsoft technologies, C Sharp has a WebAssembly target called Blazor, and it's open source, and that's pretty rad. I never thought I'd be up here. And like, if, if you told me five years ago that I'd be up here some, like telling you about Microsoft's cool new open source initiative, I don't think I'd believe you. But um, Blazor is really great, and what they've been doing with uh, MVC Core has been really great too. So what's the point of this talk? The point of this talk is try WebAssembly and maybe learn some Rust. I, uh, I, I was lucky enough that my company had like a hack day and my team, we all built a command line utility in Rust just to kind of get used to writing command line utilities and getting used to writing Rust. Um, what I wrote was, you know, like sometimes you want to put a tweet, but you want to clap in between each word, give it like emphasis. So I did that and then I added uh, rainbows and I added uh, sparkles and explosions and stuff. And so like what you do is you type out your tweet and it would print it out with the emoji and copy it to your clipboard so you could go on the Twitter and, and I called it Tweeter like tweet formatter, because, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, WebAssembly is the future of JS in all its forms. It's not just going to affect the browser, although it will probably have the biggest impact on the browser in the short term. Um, and raise your hand if you're a hiring manager. No one? Raise your hand if you know a hiring manager. OK, yeah, come on. All those hands should be up. 
What I want you to do if you're a hiring manager or if you know a hiring manager, you talk to this hiring manager. And I want you to tell them to hire someone different from you. They look different from you. They think different from you. They might not have the same gender identity as you. Something. Just hire someone who looks different from you. Because rooms like this need to get more diverse if we are going to solve the problems that the world has. Just go and do it. And before you tell me it's hard or it's awkward to bring that up with my hiring manager friends, I refer you to Mr. LaBeouf. <laughs> Just do it. Just, I don't care if it's an awkward conversation. Just tell your hiring manager, manager friend, look, can we hire someone who looks different from us? Can we, just, can we just do that? Yes, it's awkward, but we gotta do it. It's super important, or I wouldn't have put that gif up there. So thank you for listening. Before uh, anything else, I would like to read a very important quote from the late Carl Sagan. That has, it, he says science, but I want you to hear the word science and technology when I read this. All inquiries carry some element of risk. There is no guarantee that the universe will conform to our predispositions. But I do not see how we can deal with the universe, both the outside and inside universe, without studying it. The best way to avoid, avoid abuses is for the populace in general to be scientifically literate, to understand the implications of such investigations in, ex, in, sorry, ex, such investigations. in exchange for freedom of inquiry, scientists are obliged to explain their work. If science is considered a closed priesthood, too difficult and arcane for the average person to understand, the dangers of abuse are much greater. But if science is a topic of general interest and concern, if both its delights and its social consequences are discussed regularly and comp competently in the schools, the press, and at the dinner table, we have greatly improved our prospects for learning how the world really is and for both improving it and us. Carl Sagan and I think you are awesome. I can be contacted at kas at cloudflare.com and also at Node Botanist. That's where I'll be posting the link to these slides. And also there's that QR code again. Um, and a, the uh, URL at the bottom is the repo that holds these slides and my WebAssembly demo. So with that, thank you very much.